Do you need a unique and personalized touch for your products? Look no further than Romica Laser Engraving and Custom Designs. I'm Ron Phillips, co-owner of Romica Designs. We offer custom laser engraving services for a variety of products, including promotional items and corporate or personal gifts. With state-of-the-art equipment and a team of skilled designers, we can engrave intricate designs on virtually any material. Whether it's a special message, a company logo, or a custom design, Romica Laser Engraving will help you make your mark. And the best part, our prices are affordable and our turnaround time is quick. I couldn't be happier with the work Romica Laser Engraving did for me. The engraving on my product was precise and exactly what I wanted. So don't wait any longer to add a personal touch to your products. Call Romica Laser Engraving and Custom Designs today at 817-400-4040 or visit our website at romicadesigns.com. We look forward to helping you make your mark. Let's be honest, wheelchairs are heavy, bulky, and ugly. Introducing the Feather Chair Wheelchair. Order yours today and get a free wheelchair case, a $50 value. The world's lightest wheelchair is just $4.99 with easy payments as low as $16 a month. Sorry, no Medicare or insurance accepted. So call right now to order yours. 800-823-5826. That's 800-823-5826. Hey, travelers, do you want to save money on your next flight? Then pick up the phone and call. That's right, call, because the best prices are not online. They're with SmartFares. See, SmartFares has special deals with the airlines. When they have unsold seats, they use SmartFares to fill them. So you get airline tickets at ridiculously low prices. Our prices are too low to publish online. With the extra money you'll save, you can book another trip or treat yourself to dinner or shopping. So stop searching all of those travel sites to find the lowest price on your next flight. Let one of our SmartFares expert travel agents find ridiculously low prices for you. Call SmartFares today and get the best price on your next flight. Guaranteed. Also, save up to 50% off business and first class tickets. 855-325-1820. 855-325-1820. That's 855-325-1820. Fast Track Student Loans can get your student loans out of default, stop any wage garnishments, stop collection calls, and stop seizure of your tax refund. Give yourself a break. Stop the stress and get your student loan payments down to as little as $25 a month based on what you can afford to pay. 800-709-4395. 800-709-4395. Good evening, Johnson County. Welcome to this week's episode of the Texas Transparency Project. The Texas Transparency Project airs most Thursdays at 5 p.m. here exclusively on JoCo Community Radio. JoCo Community Radio focuses on all the ins and outs of Johnson County, Texas. JoCo Community Radio has many shows and airs 24 hours a day. You can visit the JoCo Community Radio Facebook page to watch shows live or to see replays. Also, you can go to www.jococommunityradio.com where Apple and Android apps are available. Tune in to get the ins and outs of Johnson County, Texas. Here at the Texas Transparency Project, we focus on three of those topics and do what we can to shed light on how they affect all of us locally here in Johnson County. One, Texas school politics. Two, Texas city politics. And three, Texas state politics, if they're applicable to us on the local level. You can learn more about the Texas Transparency Project and our work at www.texastransparencyproject.org. We're also on Facebook. And for school district resources and help navigating issues with local ISDs, we partner with Families Engaged for Effective Education. Families Engaged works with elected officials on the local and state level many school districts across Texas, but their real talent is helping parents navigate the complexities of their local ISDs and help them preserve the parental rights. There is no one better to advise and assist all of us on school district issues and families engaged. 
they have a local chapter here in Johnson County and can be and can be reached through their <laughs> Sorry about that little bit of feedback. Um, but they have a local chapter families engaged us here in Johnson County and can be reached uh, and can be reached um, at www.familiesengaged.org. This spring, like most springs in Texas, we have another general election season in full swing. Spring election season mainly focuses on more local races. This time it's mainly city councils, school boards, and school bonds. Here in Johnson County, we have quite a few elections up for grabs. A quick look at the Johnson County elections website tells us that the following city elections, and there are in Burleson, Claiborne, Venus, Joshua, which also has a bond election for the city, Godley, and Cross Timber. Independent school districts, Venus ISD, Joshua ISD, Godley ISD, Cleburne ISD, and uh, and for school bond elections, Granbury ISD has a bond, Joshua ISD has a bond, and Godly ISD has a bond. And there's a few voters in Mansfield. They're also doing a bond. Um, there's a municipal utility district in Godly. It's called Prairie View. So lots of stuff on the ballot here. Some places in some municipalities and school districts, you'll have to go to two places. They like to make it a little bit difficult sometimes. And one of the biggest ones that'll be after the May 4th election um, will be the Republican primary runoff. Um, there's no Democrat challenger, so that Republican primary runoff will be really important. Um, those are at least the main ones. And over the next few weeks, all guests will be connected to one of these elections. We wish we could have had more on, but only so much time. We put out info and, and invite people. Um, there's lots of uh, candidates that want to come on and take advantage of the opportunity. Some do and some don't, but we appreciate any candidate who's willing to come on and have their feet held to the fire. We give them an hour on this show and uh, more need to do it. We appreciate those that uh, all have agreed. Over the next few weeks, our schedule looks like the following. Next week, we're excited to have our first Cleburne guest on. City Council member Derek Weathers of SMD1 will be joining us. He's going to talk to us all things Cleburne. So if you're uh, listening from Cleburne uh, next week, we'll be talking about those races. April 25th, we have Godly ISD school board candidates who will be joining us. There's six total candidates. Three have agreed to join us. Miss Nova Olson, Mr. Don Corley, and Mr. Chris Olson. Simone Mabry, Jeff Neal, and Terry Goodlow have decided to not come on. Something about school boards for some reason is very different than other elections. All other races I cover, candidates from both sides enthusiastic, enthusiastically participate. School boards, they run scared. If I knew nothing else, other than they were too scared to participate in tough town hall style forums, it would tell me all I need to know regarding their ability to serve on a school board. If you can't come on a show like this, if you cannot go to a town hall, if you cannot have potential antagonistic questions asked to you, you are not capable of serving in those forums. That's the reality of it. And it should be a disqualifier, but Nova Olson, Don Corley and Chris Olson have agreed to come on. Um, and have their feet held to the fire, and we'll see them in two weeks. May 2nd, Ms. Helen Kerwin will be joining us. She's a challenger for Texas House District 58. Um, it will be her second time with the Texas Transparency Project, and we're excited to have her back. She's in a Republican primary runoff against Representative Dwayne Burns. May 9th, we're planning on going over the election results from the May 4th general election. That will be your city council, your school trustees, and your school bonds. So we'll be talking about that May 9th and May 16th. We'll be, uh, we'll be hosting Texas house district 58 current representative Dwayne Burns. It will be his second time on with us. And we're excited to have him back. The Texas transparency project has spent a lot of time learning about the candidates and the issues for house district 58. And this runoff election will tell us a lot regarding the direction of Johnson County and where voters are trying to take it. Um, but this week, we're staying right here in Johnson County, more locally with the spring election. We're excited to host two running for Joshua ISD school board trustees, Miss Georgia Wrighthead and Mr. Charles Bean. Um, here again, for some reason, school boards that we cannot get everybody out. It's the only um, type of election where it seems like one side always runs scared and the other side is more well, more willing to come out. But uh, Joshua ISD has been through a lot over the last couple of years. They've replaced a longtime superintendent, Fran Merrick. They've made national news a few times for some. Joe Library, you caller. 
Ooh, um, well, we're not ready to take radio Joko call. Live radio caller. Let's see what we got here. Hello, how can I help you today before we get with our guests? Well, guess we had a radio, but they're not going to talk. All right, we'll try to see if they call back later in the show after the break. Um, so the last couple election cycles, um, residents have tried to challenge some trustees. Um, Joshua has been in the uh, um, news. They've had a couple failed bonds. They had a mom that they charged for over $7,000 in open records. They made some uh, news with a school resource officer. And um, uh, um, but today we have Mr. Charles Bean and Mr. Georgia Wrighthead. Um, Charles, Georgia, welcome to the Texas Transparency Project. Tell us a little bit about yourselves and why you're running for trustee in uh, Joshua. Georgia, you first. Okay. Hey, thanks for having us. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> uh, my name's Georgia Head. I grew up here in Joshua, Texas. I went to school in Joshua kindergarten through 12th grade. Um, I've been out for a while, married my high school sweetheart. We've been married 38 years, have two grown sons and just raised our family in Louisiana. Just about three years ago, we moved back home and live on the same land, um, part of our family land next to my mom and daddy and I started getting involved with the school district here I've been a high school teacher for 27 years I retired um, in Louisiana and um, I've been to all basically all the school board meetings and or workshops um, for about the past two two and a half years and I'm also very active um, at the state level and the local, the county level with elected officials, state board of education, um, senators and re representatives, house representatives, um, fighting some of these bad education bills. So education is my life, public ed. Well, fair enough. Well, thanks for throwing your hat in the ring. For some reason, school district elections are a lot more, a lot more aggressive than most yep. others <laughs> and, and doing it two times in a row. Good for you. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Bean, Charles, uh, what, made you want to throw your hat in the ring. You have a little different lens than, than Miss Wrighthead. What, 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 what brought you to the table to try to do this? Well, thank you for having me here today, Greg. We appreciate the time you a lot for us to ex expose and discuss issues of our current um, school districts. And I've, I'm fourth generation family and I've moved back from Philadelphia where I was, I worked in the trades. I was a contractor and I've done historic restoration and worked in multifaceted areas of construction. And I chose to get back out of the city and move back to Texas with my family to get to a better environment. And we took over the family farm and I've got eight children. They've all attended the schools here and I've seen issues um, with the school district and the representation and some of the um, bonds that they've tried to pass and things that we've not agreed with, um, whether it was exaggerated causes or unnecessary needs. And I've just decided since I've started fighting property taxes a few years ago, it, which was started by my um, seeking to get an ag exemption on my property, uh, fire's grown in me and I try to help other people with ag exemptions and things like this. And then I've grown into met some women here that, that were fighting the bonds when they're unreasonable. And I just saw another avenue to help people that are struggling with finances. And some of these bonds are just taking too much from the family and they're claiming it's for our children, but it's, they don't have children. We do. Fair enough. And um, I think both of you know, Craig Hunley, um, he has a, a local Facebook group here. He's, He's been instrumental in raising awareness on on property taxes. And I don't think anybody says that that you know people should not put put into the you know into the the better good of the community. But the reality is is that it's become very oppressive and it's pushing a lot of people out of their homes. And the majority of these property taxes go to school districts. So we want to thank Craig Hunley and, and what he's done to raise awareness on this. And um, um, the reality is the two of you come from two different complete two two different lenses here so georgia um you know you, you've made it very clear that you're instrumental in in attending these board meetings these workshops for many years now you've helped a lot of parents and you've helped staff so tell us a little bit about why you're uniquely qualified in in your lens of as an educator and what you've seen in joshua to run Okay, well, um, that's kind of what got me started and got me interested in running. I see some problems. I've helped some parents. I've helped some teachers in Joshua ISD. And um, 
I've seen problems and I think that I have some solutions. I have some things that I'd like to do or, you know, vow to never vote for the, some of these things that are happening. Um, I've helped several parents with grievance processes and I know a lot of people here, Oh, grievance, that's a bad thing. No, that's, that's the, that's the mechanism that the state has put into place. That's the proper channel to follow when you have a problem with the school. My first, every time some, a parent comes to me or even a teacher, I'm like, you need to talk to the, administrator and your top child's teacher first always i'm always going to say that and because yeah I'm a teacher. informal response yes is what informal you do first and if if you don't get what you need at that point then there are some different avenues to follow so. and and the reality is the school district makes it tough on the grievance because right. the the clock is ticking you only you're exactly. very limited in time to do and there's that. reasons for that absolutely yeah. and uh and so charles while not quite as involved in georgia in, as going to these meetings and stuff like that you do bring a different level of experience to the table you have a unique understanding of how the construction business and and how that side of it works considering the difficult joshua isd has been gaining community trust regarding spending well over 100 million dollars in this bond they're proposing they've had two failed bonds how can your experience assist in negotiating these complexities and try to try to find that sweet spot to where, you know, the, the community as a whole is comfortable potentially if it, the bond's responsible enough. Um, but moving forward and not having a, a, a bond that isn't transparent and, and uh, how, how was your experience um, uniquely qualified for that? Well, first of all, I've run a business on my own for 28 years and I find that in, in personal life or in a business life, honesty and integrity is of utmost of value. And I find in the bonds and the requests for money have been grossly exaggerated in many ways. You know, we've got leaking roofs last time that they said they had to have all the roofs replaced on all the buildings. And they neglected to tell us that there was insurance coverage on that. When we brought that up, we heard crickets. And then the bond pass that come out this time um there's no mention of roofing anymore now we have concrete that's broken it just sounds like artificially um made up qualms with the school sure. district that they can ask for money on and the whole time they ask us based on it's for our children it's for our kids we got to do it and frankly they don't have any kids to claim those are my children and my community's children and when they take from the community from our personal budgets to help to better the school, it lessens the family's budget. And I'm all about family first. It's more important what these kids have at home than what they have at school. They don't need luxuries. They don't need fancy school buildings and classrooms. I understand there's limits to how many kids can be in a class. You know, let's keep it in that, but we're going to have to make uh, budget cuts in places and we need to don't stab people to death trying to take money that you don't need to operate with. There's other avenues we can go and we can make cuts. I'm tired of having uh, budgets that are approved by the current board that are approved in, in a deficit form. Sure. And it, the reality is, is that the bond mechanism is the mechanism to, to build a new school. That's the main primary mechanism. And, um, I get accused all the time of being anti-bond and I'm not anti-bond. I'm anti-irresponsible bond. I'm anti-overspending bond. I'm anti-stuff that shouldn't be in a bond going in a bond. And I'm anti just let's, you know, this, this per perpetual guilt trip that if you're, if you don't lock, stop and barrel, follow exactly what the school district says, then you're the anti-Christ of anti-children. I'm sorry to say I, I pay money to send my kid to, to a school, or to a church that that hasn't been renovated in a long time and the education they get i'm ab absolutely comfortable with i'm not anti-bond i'm not anti-school districts i'm anti guilt me into spending money that i shouldn't have to spend or that doesn't need to be spent so that's you could have the greatest thing since sliced bread that's right you need to, and if the reality is you need to be responsible in how you're doing this and it's your the onus is on the school district to justify this and to line item this stuff and that's all that the most of the community is asking for, I think. Is it fair to say that? Yeah. That you guys aren't just blatantly anti-ISD or anti-school district? Because No, because right. not at all. And the thing is, when we have a bond and the, the school takes bond money and spends it on police jackets that are lasting two to three years, maybe, you know, for a coat 
the police need a code to understand that, but we don't need to pay 30 years interest on that code after it's in the trash can. Same with flags and banners at the school. Um, that's just blatant waste. There's no way that I would buy anything that I'm going to pay interest on after it's in the garbage at my household. Sure. There, um, and you have eight children, Charles, Georgia, you have kids, you're a teacher. Um, there's, I cover everything from federal races to, to state races, to city council races. There's something about school districts to where the, the, the fangs and the talents come out. <laughs> if you do not tow the school, the school district's line, and the reality is the, the the school district needs to justify why this kind of money be spent. And I don't think anybody's not. It, that's all they're asking. That's for. All, all I, that's all I say. I'm just asking some questions. I'm not accusing anybody of anything. I'm just like, why can't we see this? Why won't you tell us? Why won't you answer the questions? Sure. You know? And uh, um, and there's some sensing sessions coming up from them. And hopefully they'll they'll answer. really answer these questions and uh, and justify this. So we're going to get into some specific issues now. Um, again, thank you guys for running. It's not easy to run for school board. Like I said, I cover a races all over and something about school districts brings out the worst in people. And, um, and it's just sad that it happens to be that way. Um, so, um, Georgia teacher retention and teacher satisfaction. You're a teacher, right? Um, I'm a firm believer that teachers are the backbone to our, our children becoming properly educated. I think the school districts and I think the state's a little bit overburdensome on them, but talk to us about why teacher retention and satisfaction is your, the number one thing on your platform. Um, I think that's real important. I think, um, a lot of the teachers and JISD or a lot of people heard a lot of things about me last year. They were just downright lies and I would invite, you know, I've always was like, y'all come sit down with me and talk to me and let me explain this. And he was like, no, we don't want to sit down and talk to you. So, um, but I'd like to explain some of that here. And the four, the, some of the things that I've watched just very, very recently, I will say as a uh, potential school board member, I would never vote in lockstep with this board, which is a whole nother thing um, we're going to get to in a minute, but the board always votes in a block in unison with whatever the superintendent and administration want. Um, they just recently voted in favor of a four day school week coming up kind of a hybrid schedule, which I mean, I'm a teacher. I mean, I'm like, yeah, I can see a whole lot of pluses to that, but let's see what the community wants, you know, and I know they did surveys and all that, but the, the point is the reason, the number one reason they said they were going to a four day week was, and I was sitting in the board, the board workshop when they said this was to attract and retain teachers. And that's the whole reason they're doing that. But then it was like in the very that same board meeting or board workshop, they passed an amendment to their district of innovation, which that's a whole nother long story of what that is. But it's where they can buy step some of the state regulations to take away some teacher planning time. Now, I'm a teacher. I did talk to online um, another teacher that said that she was really in favor of that because she thought the the what they were going to have more PLCs, which are professional learning communities where teachers get together and collaborate during that planning time. But teacher, as teachers professionally, we generally do that on our own anyway. And I don't think it's it's constructive have, to have administration taking away planning time and mandating that you be in these certain meetings when planning time is when we grade our papers, when we have our parent conferences, when we call our parents. And that way you don't have to take that home and do it. So it's encouraging and encroaching on teacher planning time. So I thought in the same breath that they said we want to do this to retain teachers and keep them and attract them, they're taking away their planning time. And then we've got um, three board meetings um, since October. They suspended three teachers' teaching credentials, certificates. Three different teachers for leaving mid-year had their credentials suspended or that the board voted in unison to suspend three teachers teaching credentials at the state level um, for breaking their contract and leaving mid-year. Now that's not illegal. Um, schools have the right. If a teacher breaks a contract, they can definitely take action to get the, their certificate. But I thought that's really rude and ugly. That's what my first thought was. Why would a school district do that? I'd never heard of that happening in Louisiana ever. And I called the um, ATPE, which is the Association of Texas Professional Educators. And I talked to their, um, one of their representatives and I said, hey, how, how, um, how common is it in Texas for a school district to put sanctions on a teacher certificate 
for something as minor as leaving in the middle of the school year. And he was like, that's not common at all. Back in, I think it was either 2019 or 2021, there was some legislation passed and they actually went a whole lot easier on, made it, made it more conducive to teachers, gave a whole list of reasons that teachers can leave during the middle of the school year and the school district is not required to do anything to them. Um, so then I got real curious. I started doing some digging into um, districts around us and I thought, I wonder how many districts around us here in the county are doing this. No, no, they're not. They're not. It's just Joshua and Joshua has done it three times this school year to three teachers. And I just think that's like, so, highly unprofessional the atpe said it was retaliatory is what he told me so let so let let me wrap this up for for the listeners real quick so we're talking about school board meetings and board work sessions so uh every school board meeting at joshua joshua does this is a good thing joshua does they have an open board work session that actually shows a little bit more of how the board works it's not quite um as in depth um as it should be it's a little more the superintendent telling the board what to do but if you really want to see a little bit more work being done beside a lot of the 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 kind of the, the pageantry of a school board meeting go to the board work session it's an hour before the meeting joshua was very accommodating that's one thing that they do good a lot of school districts burleson for example does it in executive that's bad business bad business so but during these board work sessions um and during some meetings um so nobody we don't know what happened with these teachers other than on paper it says that there was a contract uh, a, a, a violation of breaking of contract um if a teacher doesn't want to be a teacher you should let them go you should not if and i hope this isn't happening and I, we really don't know but if if a school district is making teachers think that don't want to be there that you better be here or we're going to ding your contract you're ended up having people teach kids that really don't want to do that. And, or maybe their husband got transferred across the country and they need to go, you know? Yeah. You so, know. so the reality is, is that three times they've taken a vote. We've confirmed that at least two of them have had suspended licenses. Um, there's a, a little bit of heavy handedness in Joshua Eisenstein, what they do to teachers here again. We don't know why they did this because it's an executive. It should be, that's a disciplinary thing. But the reality is, is they're dinging these certificates or these um cert these um credentials. So um um we there's just one, don't know why. There's one other note that I was at that um meeting with you and immediately immediately after they got over the topic of um speaking about the four-day school week, they were bragging about the fact that it was gonna draw a lot more teachers because of the interest in four-day weeks and they were gonna have a larger selection of resumes to go through to pick better teachers in the very next sentence they turned and said they were going to lessen the requirements of the teachers at the school what was that through cte or DOI? The, the district of innovation does okay. that. oh this yeah so, the uncertified teachers so one yeah. moment they're bragging they're going to get better choices of teachers because they're having a larger amount of um resumes to, to pick through in the very next minute they're saying they're going to take lesser quality teachers and they're not going to require as much. Of not real, not necessarily lesser quality, but uncertified teachers. They yeah, were amended that, in the DOI. That might be the wrong word. Uncertified. Right, so, yeah. so for so 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 real quick. So, you guys are running for trustees, all right? So, how would you guys navigate potentially dinging dinging a a, a certification of a um, teacher? Unless a t okay, I'm a teacher, and unless that teacher committed a crime, I'm never going to vote to have a certificate suspended. That's I mean, that's just unheard of i mean now if that teacher has committed a crime absolutely you know she's well if she's committed she, a if committed a crime then th there's a little bit of public you, record there and you know what maybe the right. community needs to be aware that you had right. a teacher own it you know and, yeah, and we're not saying that that happened children but, or something's going on in the classroom that's inappropriate yeah. or you know but, but something as petty as this absolutely not i would okay. have been I, if i had been on that board i would have said absolutely not why are we doing this to these people so this you guys is would be a little bit more accommodating to the needs of teachers oh absolutely like okay. and i mean there's another point to that um i heard about two and a half weeks ago i started hearing rumors of that from the teachers hold, that hold on i know where okay. you're going with this so okay we're gonna get to that so <laughs> um so we got about 15 seconds till our break we're gonna come after our break we're gonna we're gonna pick back up with district of innovations what they are we're going to go into what's going on with teachers and joshua isd we're here with charles bean georgia right head for joshua isd trustees we'll be back after the break
Have you ever met a single person in your life that enjoys paying taxes? No, no one does. If you can't sleep at night because you have a huge problem with the IRS, I've got some free advice for you. This service is strictly limited to individuals that owe the IRS $10,000 or more in back taxes. And if you qualify, we can guarantee that you won't be writing a big fat check to the IRS or our services cost you nothing. The first 100 people that call today will get a free tax consultation worth $500. Stop worrying about your IRS problem. We can help you. We promise. Call the tax doctor right now. I mean right now to learn more. 800-240-4587. 800-240-4587. 800-240-4587. That's 800-240-4587. Let's be honest, wheelchairs are heavy, bulky, and ugly. Introducing the Feather Chair Wheelchair. Order yours today and get a free wheelchair case, a $50 value. The world's lightest wheelchair is just $4.99 with easy payments as low as $16 a month. Sorry, no Medicare or insurance accepted. So call right now to order yours. 800-823-5826. That's 800-823-5826. Fast Track Student Loans can get your student loans out of default, stop any wage garnishments, stop collection calls, and stop seizure of your tax refund. Give yourself a break. Stop the stress and get your student loan payments down to as little as $25 a month based on what you can afford to pay. 800-709-4395. 800-709-4395. Welcome back, Johnson County, to the Texas Transparency Project. We're here with Charles Bean and Georgia Righthead running for Joshua ISD School Board. Um, before we get back and continue with the show, I want to remind everybody that Joko Community Radio is a member of EMG, a radio and podcast collective proudly serving communities like Johnson and Tarrant County, Texas. We are live 365 on the TuneIn Radio Network and on our station app. Check out our lineup and more at tuneinjoco.com. We thank our valued partners in helping us amplify the voices of our communities. You heard the commercials. Be sure to connect with Todd Hurd and Associates, attorney at law. Use code JOCO2024. That's code JOCO2024 for 25% off your first order at thetiffy.com. And join the Swipe Nation today and save on your credit card processing and SwipeNationUSA.com. Locally owned and operated, reach out to Tiffany at jo.co at jococommunityradio.com. That's jo.co at jococommunityradio.com for advertising rates as low as $50 per month. One thing about the advertising here on Joco Community Radio Um Everybody's invested in Joe in, in Johnson County that listens to this radio. So um, you're have a really, really scalpel like focus on um, on listeners. So it's a really good, good deal if you're considering any advertising. So we're talking about um, Joshua ISD. We're talking about their bond and some fiscal responsibility concerns and why these two are uniquely qualified to be your next school board trustee in Joshua. If, if you so feel that they've earned your vote. Um we're going to get back to some of the problems with teachers going on in Joshua ISD right now. But before we do that, we've been talking a little bit about district of innovation. District of innovation is the ability for a school district to create a plan that effectively allows them to circumvent some rules. Now, there's a there's a need for this, but it's also can be potentially abused. When you hear district of innovation, it immediately come to your mind that they're innovative, they're cutting edge, they're they're trend setting. But it's really we can't follow the rules for whatever reason. We need exceptions. So some of those exceptions will be going to a larger class size. Some of those exceptions will be we can't hire teachers that are certified or we don't want to. So we hire teachers that aren't certified to teach. Joshua ISD uniquely uses the District of Innovation plan 
to circumvent the state mandated requirements for comprehensive sex education. So there's a lot of it's it's basically an exception to rules. So when you hear District of Innovation, don't get wrapped around the axle axle listening to the name of it. Look at it what it is. So they're using their District of Innovation plan to to basically bring in teachers that aren't certified. Now that doesn't mean that they're not potentially great teachers. Right. However, you're setting up a four day school week to bring in the best and brightest, and now you're looking to to uh, to bring in ones that aren't certified. So the, the I guess the question is why um, and you know, who knows, but it sounds like they're trying to eat their cake and or have their cake and eat it too, or whatever that that saying is. But, um, so Joshua ISD has been heavy handedly. It looks like, um, dinging certifications for teachers. Um, here again, we don't know why this happens in executive session, but it's not the norm. It's fair to say that as an educator and reaching out to the state, it's not the norm. Nope. Um, and, here again, Joshua ISD is asking for $106 million in bonds. That's, you know, it's, it's pushing 200 million with, with interest on that. Um, and they're saying that, that, that they need all this money. They're also having some money problems that's affecting teachers in another way that we're recently beginning to hear about. Can you talk about that, uh, Georgia? Yeah. About what's going on with teachers at some schools? Um, I started hearing a rumor about two and a half weeks ago from some of the teachers that I talked to in the district that um, they were going to, uh, real, real quick, because uh, we keep talking about rumors, rumors, rumors. W what people need to understand is when you stand up against something like a school district and you withstand the, the constant bashing that comes um, when you stand up against a school district, people will continually reach out to you and tell you things that for whatever reason, they're not comfortable exactly. bringing to light, right. whether it's because their kids are in the school whether it's because there's aunts, cousins, brother-in-law employed so-and-so three generations ago at the local feed store, whatever it is, <laughs> whatever it is, they're uncomfortable um, bringing this stuff up. So is it fair to say that that's, Oh you're my getting? gosh, you wouldn't and, believe um, the people that reach out to me. Yeah. And I, I feel you. Um, so anyway, I started hearing a rumor about two and a half weeks ago that um, uh, the first rumor I heard was that 10 teachers from each middle school were going to get cut. I think I think what's been pretty well solidified and uh, and um, kind of um, backed up on social media by some employees that it's about eight teachers from each middle school have been pulled in and told that they weren't coming back next year. So so when you say cut, so teachers are a contract employee. So yes. They sign a contract for a period of time. Tell us what, what that means. They're not renewing their yeah, contract. Yeah, they're not okay. renewing their contract. Okay. Um, now, they've, and from what I've been told and understand, and what the, the district employees on social media are backing up is that those positions will not be replaced. So here we are doing these things that the board said and voted unanimously for to attract and retain these awesome teachers. We're turning right around and we're telling 16 of them that I know of, there may be more, um, that, Hey, you don't have a job next year. Now that that's just, um, that, that made me like all kinds of mad because I'm like uh, one thing, um, I was at that board workshop just this past th this month, last month, there was over $450,000 approved to be spent on new laptops and new Chromebooks. Okay. That's nearly half a million dollars. And the board voted unanimously of course, to to buy almost half a million dollars in new computers and then turn right around and let 16 teachers go. I don't know about you, but I think um, 500,000, um, you know, 400 and some 400,000 and some change could probably pay a few teacher salaries. And and here again. Tech doesn't teach your kids. Exactly. Te tech so what's more important, new yeah. computers or teachers? I and mean, that. So now. No. I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Now it's it, now we don't know who these teachers are. So we're not pointing fingers at these teachers. I don't want this. I don't want this spun that we're talking bad about teachers. Oh, gosh, we do no. not know how these no. teachers are, but hypothetically let's make the assumption that these teachers are not up to the standard that JISD wants. Then come out and say that we're looking to get better teachers. Right. Here. Yeah. The, the, this is where the, this is where the communication with the community, um, is, is paramount. So this either is a complete BS coming from multiple sources. It's true, but the district's not owning it and explaining to the, to Several the community what's going employees on. employees owned it on social media. Okay. So. Yeah. So, I mean, it, but it's still, yeah. yeah. And I'm just, like I said, well, I'm just playing devil's advocate, but let's ask why are they removing them from the two middle schools, which are the most populated schools more than likely. I mean, we've got five elementary schools that all pour into two schools. 
Yeah, the feeder. Yeah. Well, Why and they, are they just taking the teachers from that source. They no. just did a video to promote the bond about a middle school teacher teaching from a cart, which bless her heart. She is a rock star for doing that. I could not imagine teaching a class roaming around the halls in a cart and not having a classroom. But if we have a teacher teaching on a cart and we're using that to promote this bond, why are we turning right around and getting rid of teachers and not hiring them back? So it, it it's crazy. Um, here again, this is this is an example of what an ISD can do to communicate with the public because because um, teachers are the most valuable resource other than the students in the school. And I don't care about your buildings. I don't care about your Chromebooks. I don't care about any of that. I don't care about your all your your heavy your your heavy bloated administration. I care about the kid that is with my uh, the the teacher that is yeah. with my kid every day. Well, let's talk That's about the people about. that see the kids every day and work with those kids every day. Those are the rock stars. We're not talking about supervisors or I think they're called directors and executive directors down in the administration building. Why can't we combine some of those jobs? They make much higher salaries than our teachers do. Why Absolutely. aren't we making cuts there and yeah. leaving our teachers alone? I, I agree. Um, and, and the next thing they'll do is they'll say we need a bond because our classrooms are overcrowded and, and we have too many. Our student teacher ratio, they, they, the, the, the playing both sides is really, really disingenuous. And I realize a lot of this um, budget problems is because Governor Abbott um, is sitting on a he's holding a surplus of tax money hostage and not giving it to the schools, which I'm very upset about that. But um, that's a whole nother ball of wax. But we well, you, the bottom line is you deal with what you have to deal with and they know what their but they, you know, they, they set their budget. They know what the they know what the total taxable property value is in the spring. They work their budgets over the summer. They approve their tax rates. They know what they have to work with. And you just you have to work. We all have to work with it, whether, you know, if inflation goes up, our pay doesn't go up. We're working with smaller salaries. So they need to make this work. And here again, if they can't do it, then here's two options that are saying they're going to navigate this moving forward. So um, that's the reality of it. Um, Mr. Bean, you talked about that. Hey, cuts may be needed and stuff like that. Are you talking about teachers and needing to cut that? Would that be a last resort? Would you keep teachers intact? How would you navigate that? No, a source of income. Um, is not going to come from cutting teachers. That's not a primary cut. That's not going to save us from needing more structure or more equipment for children in SPED classes. And that's that's not at all where I would go to. I mean, the, the teachers, they have a, a very important position in the school. The school is because of teachers. Like other than extracurricular stuff, like that should be the last thing cut. Is I mean, I mean, teachers should be the absolute last thing cut. Yes. Like the yeah. last thing cut. Like there's so much more places to cut before you get down to teachers, in my opinion. Period. Right. Yeah, it, me it too. Is. That's the, the last thing you cut. Um, so talked about teachers a lot. We're going to move on to um, you guys are both um, committing to a very fiscally conservative approach to spending to bonds. Um, you know, I'm not a native Texan and I don't know what it is with Texas, but every single Texan I meet here in Johnson County wants to wave a conservative banner and a fiscal conservative banner, a constitutional conservative banner. But when it comes to how much money they'll, they'll allow and tolerate their school spending, they're as liberal as you can get. Sorry to say, <laughs> sorry yeah, to say, exactly. they are. and it, it's, it's, and here again, if we sit here in one town, and talk about what's going on the next time they say, well, that would never happen here while well, they're spending twice as much on there. It, it's mind numbingly frustrating being from the outside that they won't apply what they're championing to themselves and where they live. Um, Mr. Bean, you're looking at these bonds. We're talking about concrete. We're talking about 360 HVACs need to be replaced. We're talking about roofs need to be replaced. All this different stuff. Walk us through your unique perspective and your unique experience on how you would navigate this. One of my biggest points of contention is single point of of presentation of, of services. Like they're only looking at one architect, one designer. They should have multiple coming in for this. In yeah, they opinion. need to be bidding so, on contracts. Bidding. So yeah, talk to us about this piece. All right. When instead of a design build format, if you have um, professionals, even the, Starting with the architect, if, if you get a few bids, you're going to have competition. Competition drives prices mm -hmm. down because they're trying to win a job and trying to win salaries to keep their employees working. That goes with the architects. That goes, you know, and we're not talking about hiring an individual plumbing company, an individual framing company, individual electrician. You know, once we get um, 
a bid in from a, a school design we like, like like Lockheed will compete with a couple other large um, military companies to to for the government. They all get some money to bid for a contract, and the winner gets the contract. But well, once the architect firm wins a contract, you know, the, for to the design, then we can go out to con, uh, the construction companies that can place bids on the design that was provided by the architect. We don't give it to the architect and tell them you get the whole show all the yeah. way down to nuts and screws. Okay. Cause that's just, you're going to pay them twice as much if, if not more than that, because they're just going to throw everything in there knowing they got the whole job. I've watched a lot of bonds come up and I watch, you know, um, some, some districts are a little more open with their long range facility planning committees. Some do it all behind closed doors, but, but you can always see the part when it, the recommendation goes to the board, the board is calling for the bond. And I have, and I have yet to see, Hey, Huckabee, here's their recommendation. WRA, here's their recommendation. Architect A, here's their recommendation. It's, it, it's like, a, it's like hiring of a superintendent. A single candidate they're allowed to they're allowed to to choose on. This is this is this is this is this is BS. I'm sorry to say the amount of money we're talking and the amount of debt that we're assessing to these communities, and it, it's it's astronomically frustrating it to watch. Equate. It does it doesn't pass the smell test. My wife works for Lockheed. My wife works for Lockheed. My brother she, does. And uh, and and she does she's into what's called earned value management system, which is a whole major piece of accountability. And Lockheed's consistently bidding on contracts, but so is Northrop, so is L3, so is all these other companies. And the government makes a decision on all these companies. Watching a school board, the people that are actually making the decision to send it to us, the voters, only having one option, that needs to change. School board trust trustees across the board, you want to fix a lot of your bond problems and some of the animosity, get a whole bunch of architects to come in. And don't pay them to sell the bond to your community go out and have them do it because they want the job and it's important to them. And it's not important for taxpayers to shoulder that burden. Don't this is them, crap. Don't tell them we're looking for glass towers. Yeah. We don't need <laughs> fancy structures for good academics. Well, and it, it doesn't just happen to school bonds. I mean, a, a VA, a, a VA that treat a VH center in Florida years back that treated the blind paid, paid millions of dollars for artwork. in the lobbies. Oh. I mean, so this, I mean, this kind of frustrating stuff happens all over, but, um, but this fiscally conservative approach, um, really, really, really needs to take center hold. Um, there's not a lot trending well in our economy. There's not a lot trending well in people's pay versus inflation. And the only thing that seems to be astronomically skyrocketing is how much schools want us to throw into the thing. And it's a common problem. Some districts do it better than others, but they really need to get a handle on this stuff. Um, and um, well, we don't need to build. We don't need to build fancy. Nope. Not, we don't need to build. You need to crappy. build safe. You need to build safe. We I need, think safe's important. Yeah, safe will be is something important, but we also need durable. You know, I see schools when I worked in Philadelphia that are over you know, hundred years old. They're they're built stout. They last like the Cleburne um, Courthouse. It's been around forever, and it's been cleaned up and re renovated, and it still is held together. It's a good structure. You go to South Lake where I graduated high school. It's made out of foam and modified stucco. It looks like and has styled like the Cleveland Courthouse, you know, looks stylishly old, but I guarantee in 40, 50 years, it's going to be junk and bulldoze type yeah. of thing, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so you guys would commit to being extremely fiscally conservative oh, absolutely. and really justifying. So, Prioritizing, um, you know, we don't need a new scoreboard and new turf while our roofs are leaking and our air is not working, yeah, you know? Yeah. We don't need um, to be paying for concrete uh, parking lots and sidewalks at a school that was poured 10 years ago and was cracked the year that, that it opened. And they're claiming that it's damaged. So you're talking about, time. you're talking about Laughlin and Kettle. Kettle that's Kettle. right. That's right. I had a uh, So tell a us couple, about that. I uh, had a son. And that with your construction background and, and your business background. Okay. My, my closest estimation is that that property is uh, a clay pit and, they properly, it looks like they properly prepped and poured the slabs. I didn't see any issues on the school slab where the building is actually set. But, you know, the year it opened, I had a child that went to that school. I've had two children attend there before they built Nichols. And you could walk up there and stick your finger in these cracks. They were not hairline fissures. They weren't, 
you know, I've heard people saying it's they put too much water because they run in hot temperatures in the summer pouring it. It's not that because if it's too much water, you typically get a, a crumbling effect on concrete. Spalling. Yeah, spalling and crumbling. Yep. And uh, I haven't looked at it to see if there's rebar in those gaps. I was going to try to swing by and get some photographs after school hours so they didn't think I was out there trying to terrorize a school. But I haven't got a chance to look at that yet. But I believe if, uh, if a genuine contracting company was hired to pour that, there would have been a lawsuit immediately and it would have been tore out and poured correctly. There was no soil prep more than likely to accommodate pouring concrete over clay, which expands up to 10, seven to 10 times its size when it gets damp. So it just shifted and buckled and we're talking trippers. You bust, you, know, you fall on your face, knock your teeth out in that sidewalks and parking lot the first year it was open. Well, and, and here again, here's a problem. And this is a problem with the trust and the transparency that the district has. So, so you're talking about concrete. And there's all these questions about, about, you know, I look at concrete as, you know, once it's poured and set on a, you know, on a bond, they build something It becomes a maintenance and operations issue. If you need to fix it or you need to maintain it, you need to maintain it over time. That's an MNO thing. That's not an interest in sinking bond debt thing. But, um, but for example, the bond that failed la last November, you know, we keep talking about the roofs, 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 right? It was like, well, we need to repair these roofs. We need to repair these roofs. Oh my gosh, the roofs are leaking. Well, nobody wants kids in a leaky roof, but, the question is, how do you go from, oh, my gosh, look at this astronomical need we have these roofs to now they're not even on the bond. And now they're they're, you know, here in a board work session. This is some of the stuff you find in a board work session. They're suing insurance companies. So you find out that they were trying to pull the easy button lever to throw it in a bond instead of doing it the right way or doing it the difficult way. Why they have to sue an insurance company? What it looks like minute. it's an insurance That's, claim, but it was for the children. That's right. That's right. It always is. It always is. The real the real thing is that. They don't even tell you because they're talking about AC units last last bond also, along with the roofing. Correct. Do they even know which goes on first? Should you put a new roof and then replace the ACs? Or should you replace AC units and then do the roof? That's a great question. I that's a great question. That's I guarantee why... you they don't have a clue and neither do the people in the seven the seven board members. They're just gonna vote whatever they're told to do. So before we get to touch on the bond a little bit here, we're gonna touch on um what is known as the team of eight. So consistently the 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 school board and the administration collaboratively work together and they present a picture a united front that is not representative of government that's not how our elected officials are supposed to operate any other any other body doesn't operate that way um would you guys commit to asking the tough questions having the tough negotiations in the open meetings and voting your conscience not voting as a collective block that's absolutely right. i mean absolutely i'm gonna you know back teachers 100%. If any of those things I heard in this last board workshop came up, I would have been like, whoa, wait, we need to talk about this. Um, we don't do teachers like this. And I, I have to address something. I just saw a comment that um, bond funds cannot be used for consumables. That's what somebody commented. Um, but if you will request, which I have a copy we were of talking them. about that, we were talking about the teacher issue and the consumables is what you were. Thinking. Yeah. That's and then so. somebody made a comment that said that consumable items could not be purchased with bond funds. If you'll request the 2015 check register from specifically the bond funds, you will find a list of an unbelievable amount of consumables. Right. uniforms clothes um, flags flags t-shirts chromebooks the things that you're not going to finance for 30 years that's those, those are consumables so those, those pretty it's flags, happening those pretty flags in front of every campus that are flapping out there about 15 20 of them they spent ten thousand dollars on the flags and they, they from bonds, i haven't seen that stuff but from bonds are you saying from yes. bonds? i don't know that for a fact I, I, I do have the check registers from the bond expenditures and i would be happy to send them that anybody that wants them um so if, so if you question whether or not bond funds were used for consumables, um, Miss Georgia Wrighthead, don't avoid her because you think she's the Antichrist and hates kids. <laughs> Reach out and talk to her. Ask her if she can prove what she's saying. I'm, I, I mean, can that's, prove. If I'm going to say it, yeah. I can prove it. Well, there's another. And if I'm wrong, I want somebody to point it out, and I'll apologize, and I'll fix it. Yeah, that, I, maybe the flags weren't on the bond, but I've seen them, the expenditures, and either way, $10,000 towards flags that tear up in a year is not a good experience. Well, yeah, and especially when you're if you have to cut teachers cuz of cuz of budgets. Yeah, yeah, no. No. Yeah. We can cut out some things that we don't need before yeah. Flags we are teachers. cool, but you know, come on. Yeah. Um, Georgia and I have nothing to gain from this position from from become seat holders. We're not bankers and we're not realtors that that 
benefit from neighborhoods moving in. But you only have eight lending. kids. If you had 10, you'd care more. You only have eight. <laughs> you only got eight kids, Charles. If you had 10, you'd care more. I might marry a woman that has five or six. <laughs> okay. you know? Oh, there you go. So, um, so we're going to touch on this bond real quick. Um, bond is broken down into four propositions. That's one thing that they did change. That's that was good. positive. Yeah. That's a good the thing. Community Joshua asked, ISD, did a good yeah, thing. really good job. Community yeah. asked for that and they did it. So yeah, I'm very impressed absolutely. with that. So um, great job. So thank you for that. Um, one thing about this bond, when you hear about $106 million, you really, really need to look at, um, you need to go to Johnson County elections, Johnson County, Texas. So you don't get Kansas, Johnson County. Right. Johnson County, <laughs> Texas elections, and, and pull up the notice for the bond order. You'll see the four propositions in there. Um, they clearly state that they can raise taxes um, up to the rate needed to pay off the bond debt. I think if all four pass, it's going to be a 17 cents increase. So you will have a 17 cents um, increase in your INS tax rate if all four pass. That's going to bring us uh, bring jo Joshua to about 50 cents. Um, they're one of the lowest now. That's going to bring them up quite a high. I think they um, said that's going to be up by uh, Burleson, and it's only behind Godly. Well, God, Godly's so far ahead of everybody <laughs> else. You got eons to catch them. Here again, Godly ISD thinks they can call a $365 million bond with half the enrollment and not raise taxes, and it doesn't affect your taxes. Joshua is at least very honest about it. They're going to raise the tax rate, and if you go on their bond information thing, at least they say that in an economic downturn, they can raise taxes sufficient to pay the bond debt, which is accurate per Ed Code. Well, and, um, Godley was really proud of their bonds, and they're really trying to get the next one to pass through. And go and, Wildcats! In, in, in the in the school district terminology, that's a win getting a getting a bond. Yeah. And I'll tell you right now, Godley is the winner, and Joshua wants to be second place, but second place is the first loser. That's right. Um, so Prop A is $63 million. It's going to build the new elementary school in the Pan Sharp community that's being built. Um, so that's a new elementary school. Um, and it's going to add on some classrooms and a lab space to Nichols Middle School. That's what Prop A is for. Um, the principal is $63 million. Um, the interest alone is expected to be $43 million. So that $63 million for Prop A is really $100 million. Really, a little over a, a little over a hundred million. Prop B is for a cafeteria expansion. Um, that's an that's about a nine, just under nine million dollar bond with six million in interest. That's really fifteen million. Um, so now we're up to about one hundred and sixteen million with those two. Um, um, the cafeteria is supposed to. It doesn't say how many seats it will expand to. It talks about four hundred. It does. I can't determine whether or not how many kids, more kids you're getting in that. Um, it is going to eliminate the, a ramp that they have that they have to push carts up that, that they say is unsafe. So it's going to clean up the cafeteria and kitchen. Um, Prop C is a CTE expansion, which is expanding a couple CTE programs. It's consolidating some, which will free up some classrooms in the high school. It's going to you're going to have a really cool place to go get your haircut with its own entrance. Um, that, that one of the big things they're, they're real proud about. Um, but that's a CTE expansion, career and technical education. Um, and also about, um, HVAC and paving and, or that's in the next one, I think, but that's a $30 million principal with $20 million. So that gets us from 115 from prop A and prop B to another 30, 40, 50 million. So we're up to about 165 million for this $106 million bond now. Um, and then Prop D is for HVACs, 360 HVACs. Oh, my God. If you have not maintained HVACs where you need 360 <laughs> new ones, you might want to look at how you're doing business. Anyways, time go, always goes quick. Go Owls. Go Owls, yeah. Charles Bean, Georgia Ridehead, Joshua ISD. It's an alternative to how they're conducting business now. Take care. See you next week with Cleburne City Council Member Derek Walker. From Burleson to Venus and Grandview to Godley, this is the voice of Johnson County, Joko Community Radio. Why have thousands of aspiring authors teamed up with Christian Faith Publishing to publish their book? Because Christian Faith Publishing is an author-friendly publisher who understands that your labor is more than just a book. We provide authors freedom and flexibility throughout the publishing process, professional book editing, award-winning design, and some of the highest royalty structures in the publishing industry. And as always, you will retain 100% of the rights to your book. I was looking to find a company that I could trust, one that assisted in the editing process completely. The most important qualities that I was looking for was a publisher who was 